To begin, let us acknowledge that Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. We thank the Indigenous people for their care of this land for thousands of years, and we hope to honour and respect them as we hold our virtual event today. I'd also like to take a moment to personally thank everyone for joining today's presentation. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Todd Hatchett, who will be presenting on what's new in tick-borne diseases in Nova Scotia. Dr. Hatchett is currently the Chief of Service for the Division of Microbiology at the QE2 Health Science Centre and the Director of Virology and Immunology. He is a professor in the Department of Pathology with cross appointments in the Departments of Immunology and Microbiology and Medicine, where he is a consultant in infectious diseases. Dr. Hatchett oversees the laboratory that does Lyme disease serological testing for Nova Scotia, as well as Prince Edward Island, which is the first laboratory in Canada to use the modified two-tier testing algorithm. He has given CME lectures to various healthcare professionals and serves as an advisor on a number of committees related to zoonotic infections. He is also a member of the Infectious Disease Expert Working Group in Nova Scotia, was the provincial co-chair of the Lyme Disease Diagnostic Working Group of the Canadian Public Health Laboratory Network and was president of AMMI uh, Canada from 2018 to 2020. We will have Dr. Hatchett present and then we will open from questions from the audience. You can ask questions by entering your questions in the chat box or raising your hand using the icon. Please help us welcome Dr. Hatchett to the podium. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here. Make sure that you can see that. Did it work, Veronica? You guys can see yes, that. Yes, it looks perfect. Thank you. Okay, perfect. So we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, tick-borne diseases in Nova Scotia, what's new, and, and focus on some of the data that we've either published or um, have implemented and, uh, you know, I just want to acknowledge that there's lots of work, um, collaborative work going on with uh, Dr. Stringer's group, Dr. Frampton's group. Um, there's there's a number of things that are are still being uh, worked on, but this is sort of the, where we are right now in, in Nova Scotia. So uh, first course is uh, my disclosure slide. I have funding from CIHR, Nova Scotia Health Research Foundation, um, Genome Canada. I've had some uh, co-investigator funding through uh, some uh, companies and uh, sit as a consultant or an advisor on a number of government uh, committees, as mentioned, as well as past president of AMBA Canada and some other stuff, but nothing uh, specifically related to Lyme disease other than the research funding. So, um, We'll talk about three things today. We'll talk about what's new in Lyme, we'll talk about what's new in anaplasma, and we'll talk about uh, what's new in Babesia, and that'll, that'll be sort of how we end things off as, as we're sort of uh, moving from our most prominent uh, zoonotic pathogen to our least. So as most people know, Nova Scotia has the highest incidence of Lyme disease in Canada, and that's this graph uh, over at the side uh, here, the, the bar graph, you can see the, the, the cases, uh, but the little triangle gives uh, incidence, and uh, we do have the highest incidence in Canada. And if you look at the risk map uh, that is put out by the provincial government every year, essentially all of Nova Scotia, except for the Highlands and Cape Breton and uh, Guysboro County is considered higher risk areas. So um, these are, are sort of determined based on the number of people that get infected in those areas, as well as a uh, uh, percentage of positivity in ticks uh, when there is sampling done uh, in those regions. So you can see that the vast majority of Nova Scotia is what we would consider a higher risk area where uh, often the, the tick populations are infected with more than, uh, more than 20% of the ticks are infected with uh, Borrelia. Now, um, from a diagnostic perspective, everyone is, is probably aware that the, the current recommended um, test that is available in most places in Canada is the standard two-tier algorithm where individuals who have suspect Lyme disease get tested with an ELISA. And if that ELISA is positive uh, or equivocal or reactive of some sort, then they will go on to have a second test, which is an immunoblock, both an IgM and an IgG. But we know that the performance of this, uh, of this particular algorithm um, varies by the stage of infection. And I've highlighted in the, the big blue uh, bar here that uh, the standard two-tier algorithm only has about a 40% sensitivity rate in those that have early localized Lyme disease. So we're always looking for a better way to uh, diagnose Lyme disease. 
Now, there's lots of work that have gone into the development of algorithms to help frontline clinicians uh, in the management of early localized infection. And this is one that was a collaborative uh, effort um, that involved uh, a number of uh, primary care specialists and patient uh, engagement um, uh, as well that has come up with a, uh, this is the Center for Effective Practice, which is freely available online and uh, has been used to help um, focus the management of early localized Lyme disease, knowing that the, the serologic testing we have is suboptimal and, and making sure that people are aware that it is primarily a clinical diagnosis that requires treatment. But is there a way that you can increase the uh, sensitivity? And that's where this modified T-tier algorithm comes in. So a number of years ago, um, just prior to the pandemic, the FDA recognized the modified two-tier algorithm that instead of the second tier being an immunoblot, you can uh, test anyone who had a positive ELISA with a second ELISA. And those that have uh, positive or equivocal results are considered uh, to have evidence of Lyme disease, serologic evidence of Lyme disease. This was recognized by the FDA and was further endorsed by the CDC. And uh, that certainly set us into motion to try and validate this in our local context. And uh, in fact, uh, we published this in, in 2020. We, we actually um, did look at the two-tier algorithm uh, as a way that we could uh, evolve from the standard two-tier. Validating any of these assays is difficult given that the early localized infection is predominantly clinical. So you need to actually have... Uh, um, patients' histories in order to really determine who has Lyme disease. So what we did was we had parallel testing of samples that were submitted to Lyme disease using the modified two-tier, and this was using the whole cell uh, ELISA followed by the C6 ELISA, and then uh, compared that with the standard two-tier, which was whole cell followed by immunoblot. And this was a sort of retrospective sampling from 2011 to 2014. And then we looked at those that were positive by the MTT, but negative by the standard two tier and did a chart review to determine whether or not those individuals had Lyme disease based on their clinical features. And you can see below, this is a table from the publication, just outlining uh, what was defined as uh, Lyme disease based on the uh, current sort of uh, uh, guidelines uh, through the IDSA. And what we did was we basically saw uh, that during that time frame, there was over 10,000 specimens tested by whole cell EIA. The vast majority were negative. Of those that were positive, we had a bunch that were positive by um, the two-tier system. And we were able to review about half of those charts. Now, again, this, this is a uh, retrospective study that extended you know, five to six years before that, and sometimes the charts weren't available or we couldn't get a hold of the physician to, to do them. Um, of the 271s that were reviewed, there were uh, 44 that were considered false positives. So they didn't have symptoms that would be consistent of uh, Lyme disease. And there, and there were uh, 227 true positives which uh, had a smattering of early localized, early disseminated, late Lyme disease, and then um, uh, past infections. So those that uh, would have had serologic evidence uh, previously. And what's important is that the modified two-tier really does detect more early infections. So you can see that uh, this circle that I've highlighted here is uh, the cases that had both the whole cell, the C6 positive, but had completely negative immunoblocks. And um, the vast majority of those were early localized infection, but there were some early disseminated infection that uh, they were positive that had negative immunoblocks. And this basically equates to an increase in detection of about 25% over the standard two-tier algorithm. Now, one of the concerns that everyone raises is uh, uh, what effect on specificity would, uh, would be uh, made with this particular algorithm. And when you do the calculation, assuming that uh, uh, the false negative results would be equivalent to what's in the literature in terms of a sensitivity for 55% for localized infection, 
you can see that the specificity is actually equivalent to the standard two-tier algorithm where the specificity was over 99.5%. So um, this uh, really was the first Canadian study to show that the modified two-tier system um, has uh, excellent specificity and enhanced sensitivity for early localized infection. Now, unfortunately, the C6 uh, assay was, uh, they stopped actually manufacturing it, so we actually had to validate it a second time, um, which provided us the opportunity to see, to ensure that the our, our first uh, set of data was concurrent with what we thought it would be. Um, and we used the same study design, but we just used different uh, assays. So in this particular study, we used the one that was uh, uh, initially um, highlighted by the FDA uh, as a valid alternative to the standard two-tier algorithm. And again, uh, we were able to publish this uh, recently, and this was uh, in 2023, uh, looking at, again, uh, the performance of the, these two EIAs compared to the standard two-tier. And you can see that uh, because this was a this was sort of a retrospective uh, look over over about a year, we did not have nearly as many specimens, but still started off with almost 2,200 specimens. Uh, we were able to review uh, most of the charts that were were there. Um, again, any any uh, chart review is a challenge uh, because you in Nova Scotia we do testing for the entire province, so we have to reach out to primary care clinicians across the province to try and get uh, information on this. Now, some of the ones that we couldn't have uh, had Western blots, uh, IgG Western blots are a positive, which would be considered uh, true positive by our case definition. So really, there were very few that were, were missed in terms of, of uh, those that, that didn't have uh, either immunoblot evidence or clinical evidence to help us categorize them as Lyme disease. And again, we found that the specificity was very good. It was 99.6%. So basically dead on uh, compared to the previous study that we did. And that uh, the eight individuals that uh, clinically meet the criteria for Lyme disease considered to have false positives, um, six of the eight had uh, negative IgM and IgG immunoblots. Only two of them had positive IgM immunoblots. And only three of them, unfortunately, went to have convalescent serology, but all of them remained negative from uh, a Western blot uh, perspective. So we're reasonably confident that these indeed were uh, false positive uh, cases, but again, the specificity is, is excellent uh, with this particular algorithm. Um, and just as important is that uh, this algorithm, again, detected 28% more cases of early infection uh, compared to the standard two-tier algorithm. So um, it really helped reinforce the fact that uh, that this algorithm works well in the in our uh, context of a of an area where there's a reasonable number of Lyme disease cases. Now, we've shown that it's more sensitive. We've shown that it's as specific. But the biggest thing that advantage for from uh, our perspective and and certainly for the clinicians is the turnaround time was significantly improved with the modified two tier system. So with the standard system, because uh, there are very few places in Canada that do the immunoblots, we sent ours to the National Micro Lab, which means that they had to be batch sent once a week. Um, if you miss the run when the time they got there to, at, uh, uh, um, at the National Micro Lab, then they would wait for the run in the following week. So the turnaround time, as you can see, highlighted in the red box is about 27 days. So it is not a great turnaround time when you uh, might want to use it to influence your clinical decisions. However, with uh, the ability to do both ELISAs in our own lab, our turnaround time uh, on average uh, was less than three days. And you can see that the, uh, the over 50% were actually uh, within 48 hours. So um, between 48 and 72. So it really does change how you can use this, um, uh, use serology, in that uh, those that don't have the classic early localized infection signs, the uh, oval rash that progresses, for example, uh, there is the opportunity to do a watch and wait retest in two weeks to see if you get seroconversion, um, which is much more uh, easy to do when the turnaround time is three days instead of three weeks. So that has been a significant improvement and we've had lots of good feedback from our frontline clinicians. 
But even with a turnaround time of three days, were there circumstances where the where testing more rapidly is, is important? This brings us to a, another project that was done in Nova Scotia uh, in collaboration with our IWK colleagues, uh, spearheaded by um, uh, Dr. Stringer, who's uh, I think on the call. Uh, in kids with arthritis, and people may or may not know that in Nova Scotia, we see lots of kids with, arth uh, with Lyme arthritis. And it is often very difficult to clinically differentiate Lyme arthritis with other causes of both inflammatory and mechanical arthritis. And one of the, um, one of the mimickers or one of the syndromes that looks similar to Lyme arthritis is septic arthritis, meaning a bacterial infection of the joint, uh, a, a prototypical bacterial infection like Astaph aureus, for example. In those circumstances, really the only way you can rule that out is by doing a joint aspiration or an urgent washout uh, which requires surgery it's invasive and there was a question was well if we could quickly identify kids with positive serology would um, would that be of benefit and one of the challenges again because of the uh, nature of the test and the the high throughput or the the need to to batch things in order to get into a high throughput lab was we had to have an assay that, that might uh, uh, be able to be used in this circumstance. And that's where, where uh, it comes to the SOFIA assay. So this is a fluorescent immunoassay. So again, it's an ELISA, but it, uh, um, it generates a fluorescent signal that has to be read by this machine. And you can see the, the little box, the little black box there, there's a blue tray that's below it. The um, cartridge will go in there and it will determine whether there are antibodies uh, in the patient's serum. Uh, the list of individuals that are listed on the, uh, on the left side of your screen are the research team that did a lot of this. Um, we really wanted to determine what the sensitivity and specificity of this particular rapid near point of care test would be and whether it would discriminate kids with Lyme arthritis from other forms of arthritis. Because if it was accurate in doing so, then this could be something that could be done quickly and potentially save a child from uh, having an operation. So what we did was uh, we worked uh, with the IWK lab and our lab, and we were able to uh, identify 106 kids who had been seen for musculoskeletal complaints. And again, I've, I've shown a picture of the cassette there. It looks very similar to a uh, rapid antigen test for Lyme disease. Most people know that what the, those certainly look like. This is a, a, a bilateral flow so that the sample goes in the middle and then it, 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 it goes by, um, it flows up the membrane, uh, both on the uh, upper and the bottom part so that you can differentiate, differentiate IgG and IgM antibodies. What we did was we looked at that serum and we ran all of the 106 serum on the Sophia Lyme FIA and compared it to the standard two-tier test. Again, that being the, uh, the standard that is often presented in the literature. And we um, defined uh, a positive result as one that has um, IgG antibodies because as most people realize, by the time you have Lyme arthritis, uh, you should have IgG antibodies as a component of the serological profile. So if you had an IgM in the absence of an IgG, that was considered a false positive. We also looked at the analytical specificity of this by testing uh, the SOFIA's ability to, uh, or, or its reaction to sera from other patients that have mimickers of Lyme disease and potential cross-reactive cross -reactive um, conditions like syphilis. Uh, we had a number of, we tested a number of EBV positive IgM specimens and a number of specimens that were positive for ANA, which is uh, a marker for rheumatologic conditions. So in the uh, total assay, we had, or the total uh, investigations, we had uh, 52 uh, kids with positive Lyme arthritis and 55 uh, individuals that had non-Lyme arthritis, and the causes of non-Lyme arthritis are, are outlined in that pie chart there, and you can see the vast majority of them had uh, juvenile arthritis, idiopathic juvenile arthritis, JIA, 
Another sub substantial portion had mechanical causes, so they didn't actually have an inflammatory component, um, but had other reasons for uh, mechanical um, mechanical uh, manifestations of joint pain. Uh, only one case was a septic joint, which is one of the limitations of the study, is that we only did have one case of, of, of septic joints. But what you can see is that all of the uh, Lyme arthritis were detected by SOFIA. So the SOFIA FIA picked them all up. And in uh, those that did not have Lyme arthritis, there were only two uh, SOFIA uh, IgG positives. Uh, which led to a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 96%. So again, very good performance uh, comparatively. This test can give you a result within 20 minutes uh, and is, uh, is relatively easy done and can be implemented at, uh, in labs uh, more broadly than um, the centralized labs that, uh, that are um, required to be sent in for uh, usual testing in, in the provincial public health lab systems in many places. We did see a number of positive IgM specimens in non-arthritis patients, but again, the immunoblot testing confirmed that these were actually IgM negative, so there, well, there was some cross-reactivity with uh, the IgM component that gave some false positives, but again, because it really is the IgG component that is, is important here, um, the uh, IgM uh, component can actually be turned off in the instrument so that you, uh, that you don't even have to see that. So um, we did do the analytical specificity again, where we took a number of healthy uh, individuals. Uh, we took about 10 patients with uh, positive ANA and 10 patients positive with uh, Epstein-Barr virus. The rest were considered healthy individuals, which was uh, basically residual sera that was collected as part of a sera survey done uh, in 2012. And you can see that there are some challenges with uh, specificity in some of these um, Lyme disease mimickers. So in EBV, uh, there, there were three individuals that had positive IgGs on the SOFIA, which were actually negative by the standard two tier. And uh, there were four um, individuals who had positive ANAs that also had uh, positive SOFIA IgGs. Now, how clinically relevant is this? Well, EBV doesn't really give you the same sort of arthritis type components that you would see uh, with, uh, with, juvenile, with, with uh, uh, Lyme disease arthritis. So um, that is not a huge issue. ANA would be a potential rheumatologic um, manifestation, but again, this basically will allow you time to do the uh, confirmatory modified two-tier, proper modified two-tier system and not take the child to uh, surgery so it spares them surgery. And because the performance in, in terms of, uh, of uh, sensitivity is, is good, um, you, uh, you, you really uh, are potentially impacting the care of, of these kids. So this is something that uh, has, been, um, has been presented at ECMID as a poster. We are in the middle of writing it up as a, as a manuscript and uh, we're in the discussions with the, the team at the IWK, the lab team at the IWK about how we can imp implement this so that we can you know, further determine um, uh, and ensure that it is it is um, helping uh, prevent um, surgeries in, in, in kids with uh, Lyme arthritis that don't require interventions but can be treated with antibiotics. So that's uh, that's kind of the end of the diagnostic updates that we've done over the last two or three years. But one of the other things that Nova Scotia has done in the last year is that they've expanded the scope of practice for pharmacists to be able to prescribe doxycycline prophylaxis. And um, again, highlighting that most of Nova Scotia is a higher risk area. Uh, these would generally be places where you would expect that the percentage of infected ticks is greater than 20%. So um, any of those regions, if an individual comes within 72 hours of pulling an engorged tick off their body and can identify it as a black-legged tick, and they would qualify for prophylaxis. They can do this by walking into the pharmacist. The pharmacist can have a look at the tick. We did an education uh, program for the pharmacist to try and uh, identify ticks. 
at least the genus of the ticks, but to differentiate the two most common ones we see in Nova Scotia, which would be the dermacenter or dog tick, which uh, has the sort of scalloped festoons around the edges and has a different looking anal pore. So uh, we provided this information to the pharmacists as a bit of an educational program so that uh, they are able to uh, differentiate the tick to help them determine who requires doxycycline. It, um, it certainly has expanded the access to prophylaxis. Uh, one of the concerns is that like the rest of Canada, Nova Scotia struggles with um, uh, people who do not have primary care physicians. And those that do have primary care physicians, it's often very difficult to get in on a rapid basis. So it also will reduce the burden on emergency rooms. Um, we do currently have a program uh, evaluating this or a project evaluating this program with the School of Pharmacy at Dalhousie to see uh, you know, what the uptake take has been, how many prescriptions there have been, and get some idea of whether there, it has reduced the burden of emergency room visits uh, in some of the higher prevalence areas of the province. So stay tuned for that information. Um, the data is being pulled and analyzed as we speak. So I'm gonna transition now away from uh, Lyme disease and talk about human granulocytic anaplasmosis because this is the, the new um, bug on the block. Um, and we've known that uh, anaplasma has been in our ticks. The last uh, active survey that's been published in 2019, you can see that uh, anaplasma, which is in the first column, about 4% of the ticks were positive. Um, and you can also see that, uh, you know, we, we had substantially higher positivity rates for Borrelia, over 27%. And these are all cumbersome ticks in the area that were collected through active surveillance. Um, for those who are not familiar with anaplasma, uh, it often presents as a summertime influenza. And it is, they're quite febrile. Um, you often have aches and pains. Uh, rigors, which means you uncontrollable shaking. Uh, headache is often a, a common feature. And um, some of these features overlap with Lyme disease as well, uh, if you don't see the rash. If you do see a rash, uh, then it's more likely to be Lyme. But, you know, the question is, could you have co-infection? So how do we diagnose uh, human granulocytic anaplasmosis or anaplasma is we often look for reasons to look for. So there are suspicious laboratory parameters. They often present with uh, low platelets and uh, low lymphocyte count, and they often have elevated uh, liver enzymes. So if you see this cluster, this was the first signal that um, people would look for and actually specifically ask for anaplasma. The challenge is that it doesn't grow on a normal media that we would use for bacterial infections. It requires cell culture, but that is a uh, specialized process that most places don't have capability to do. So the mainstays of diagnosis are actually looking for the organism on the blood smear uh, and doing PCR to detect its nucleic acid in, uh, in blood. There is also the possibility to do acute and convalescent serology. So, uh, and and this is in, this is a helpful uh, a helpful diagnostic method when you don't necessarily do the test early enough when the bacteria is clearly present in the uh, in the blood. <clears throat> so, th these are some slides of one of our hematopathologists of one of our cases of anaplasma, and all the arrows point to morulae, which are intracytoplasmic inclusions of the organism. So these are intracellular pathogens. Um, they often, again, see thrombocytopenia, you have low levels of platelets, and the hematopathologists, depending on where you are, have uh, automated systems which will look for unusual features in a blood film, and this has been a way that has triggered people to look for anaplasma and um, was one of the reasons why we were interested in looking this further because we were getting more calls about these uh, potential inclusions. Now, the sensitivity of this is only about 60 to 70%. So PCR has really become the mainstay of diagnosis for the early infection. And like any infectious disease, the organism will be detectable before your immunologic um, uh, antibody response is detectable. So in early infection, PCR is by far the best way to do this. So in Nova Scotia, we've seen a smattering of cases of anaplasma. Our first case was described in a force in, in 2011. 
And then over the last three or four years, we've seen increasing sporadic cases. First one diagnosed in 2017, and then uh, we had uh, a few in 2020. But then in, uh, in uh, 2022, we started to see more cases. We had hematopathologists calling us with these morulae. We've had uh, physicians who um, would send people in because of thrombocytopenia, and we were seeing more cases. One of the things we wondered was, were we missing co-infections? So one of the uh, quality initiatives that the lab undertook was working with Rob and Lindsay's lab. Um, we sent a, a 500 positive Lyme specimens for anaplasma PCR to see if we we're missing many co-infections, because that would certainly give us a signal that we need to be looking for more um, prospectively. And of the 50 anonymized samples, 12 were positive. So we had a 2.5% positivity rate. So that was, uh, was important information. But the argument that we needed to solve was whether the serum was an adequate sample because uh, traditionally whole blood uh, or using the Buffy coat, the white cell layer, has been the ideal sample. So what we did was we actually then went on to validate whether or not serum was an uh, appropriate sample for anaplasma testing. So what we, uh, again, working with Robin Lindsay's group at the NML, we tested two groups of anonymized specimens. We took serum samples from those that had positive whole blood, whole blood cell uh, um, anaplasma positive, because often people will send a panel to the NML, they'll send serum for Lyme disease as well as uh, whole blood for anaplasma. And we tested acute and convalescent serum samples for patients uh, who had uh, um, samples submitted to the NML, again, using uh, nucleic acid amplification testing, so a PCR-based assay. And what we found was that uh, the PCR on serum samples had a, uh, was positive in 85% of the cases of those who had whole blood uh, cell positive. Not surprising, the CT value, which gives you an estimation of how much bacteria is there, was uh, a little bit uh, higher, which means there was less bacteria. It's inversely proportional um, to the bacterial load in uh, serum compared to whole blood, but it was still uh, higher than the threshold for positivity. What's interesting is that about 18% of these had serology that was less than 1 in 64, which is a lower limit of detection. So really showing the value of it detecting um, infection early on in, uh, in the course of the illness. And the, of the serum samples that were negative, that uh, the whole cells were pos positive, uh, the CT values were very high, meaning there was, there was a very little uh, bacteria there, which could suggest that it's towards the end of the, uh, the period where you can detect it in the, in the blood. So when we did the, uh, when we looked at the acute and convalescent serum, again, we had similar findings where uh, the sensitivity and specificity was 82 and 93%. Some of the PCR positives didn't seroconvert, but we do know that you can have delayed seroconversion with early uh, antibiotic administration, which may have influenced that, uh, that finding. So what we concluded from this was that serum sampling serum was an acceptable specimen for testing. If suspicion was uh, high and you wanted to confirm that whole blood or an acute and convalescent serology uh, could be submitted. So why is this important? Well, people don't uh, generally send in whole blood for um, serologic testing. We have lots of Lyme disease testing in Nova Scotia. We have seven to 8,000 specimens a year. Uh, it is our highest volume test that's not on one of these high um, throughput analyzers where we do bloodborne infections like HIV and hepatitis C. Um, so if you had to add whole blood to a serum to do sort of a tick-borne panel, that becomes uh, logistically challenging and uh, more difficult to implement. So what we did was we proved that serum worked, and then we started adding uh, anaplasma PCR to every Lyme disease specimen that was submitted for testing. And we did this in uh, uh, late July. And this is just sort of a curve showing the number of positive patients 
up until October, and, and it, it stops at October because that's the the data that I have uh, able to share for you. I don't have the the data extending towards uh, December. Um, and interestingly, it was about 0.9 to 3.3 percent among Lyme requests. So lots of anaplasma in Nova Scotia, and this has been uh, helpful in uh, identifying early cases. And we uh, next wanted to figure out, well, how are people clinically presenting um, with these infections? So uh, Dr. Glenn Patrick Wynn and one of our fellows uh, has a chart review that are looking at all the patients that uh, presented with positive PCR for anaplasma up until October and um, uh, did a has a has a uh, questionnaire that they complete to look at the clinical and epi epidemiologic features of uh, those that presented with infection. This is just some preliminary date because uh, data because some of the um, some of the the cases are, are case reviews are still ongoing. But you can see that the vast majority of individuals with anaplasma are in western zones. So this. This is the place where Lyme disease started. It, it's, it is still the area where um, the vast majority of cases of Lyme disease are. Uh, and you can see that it's only been a smattering of some of the other places uh, where we're seeing anaplasma. So it looks like it's following a Lyme disease trajectory where it started mainly in Western zone and is then expanding across the province. Uh, but it wouldn't be surprising if we start seeing this in cases uh, in other areas. The um, average age was, or the median age was 66 years old. Um, there's a predominance of, of males uh, in the, those that were infected. And what's interesting is that 64% of them actually did have morulae on their smears. So again, kind of goes to the sensitivity specificity of, uh, of the smears, which is in the range of 60 to 70%. But it also shows that you know, we are detecting true infections and it's not, uh, it, it's not just an artifact of increased testing to getting, um, you know, more numbers. Um, most of them had, a, had been treated with doxycycline, uh, median duration of about 14 days. And you can see in the, the uh, sections below, um, similar to the literature, the number of people who presented with uh, lab abnormalities was high and the most common was low platelets where normal platelets would be um, sort of around 140. You can see that this was 96. Uh, they, they were slightly anemic, uh, their lymphocyte count was low and they had a slightly raised uh, liver enzyme uh, AST, which is just about twice the limit of normal. So very similar to what uh, the literature would suggest in that you get cytopenias and some liver inflammation. 78% of those documented were called a tick bite, but as we know with Lyme disease, it's not knowing that you've had a tick bite that's important, it's knowing that you're in an area where you're at risk is more important because you don't always notice when you get a tick bite. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the charts had no documentation whether they had ticks or not, so it's not something that people ask, and maybe that's because we have been educating uh, clinicians that uh, whether or not there's a tick bite there is irrelevant in terms of, of making your decision, certainly in Nova Scotia. Um, as I showed before, in terms of the symptoms, again, very common fever was the most common thing. Weakness and some confusion were, were also common features. Uh, 17 of these individuals were admitted to hospital and stayed about a week. Uh, but thankfully, there have been no deaths. So we are actually doing um, uh, ongoing uh, collection of uh, information so that we can further refine this, uh, uh, this case review and uh, hopefully we'll publish soon enough. Um, there is going to be a survey of physicians to, uh, to look at the knowledge and beliefs uh, around anaplasma to see where the gaps are to help with educational programs in the future. So there are some other little projects that have sprung off of this. So the vast majority of patients, from an anaplasma perspective, the vast majority of patients that are PCR positive are coming from our Western zone, which is the sort of epicenter for a lot of the lot. Um, the clinical presentation is very similar to what you see in the literature, 
most patients were treated with doxy uh, and often prior to the PCR reporting, which <clears throat> suggests that, again, most people are being uh, tested based on clinical uh, parameters and that these findings uh, can help clinicians identify patients who are at high risk of anaplasma, which of course leads to timely treat testing and treatment decisions. So this is a really an emerging disease in Nova Scotia that we've implemented as part of a tick-borne, uh, an expanded tick-borne disease panel uh, to help uh, document and uh, treat individuals uh, moving forward. And I think it's been pretty successful. So uh, the, the last thing that I'll briefly discuss is that Babesia is uh, the next up and comer. And like everything else, it starts off with sporadic cases. And we have seen three cases to date. Uh, this is a publication um, one of our fellows put together, again, with a number of our clinicians that looked at the first case of uh, Babesiosis in Nova Scotia. And again, <clears throat> this is a parasite that is transmitted by the black-legged tick. Uh, you can see in the panel uh, A, B, and C, it's a blood film, and you can see and see the uh, the parasite within the red cells, including almost that Maltese cross appearing, uh, you know, sort of pathognomonic feature uh, of Babesia. And we expect that we'll start seeing more. And the uh, goal is to actually add Babesia PCR to the tick-borne disease panel. Again, uh, what we'll need to do first is validate that serum has acceptable performance characteristics, because again, uh, whole blood has been traditionally the, the marker that people would use, but um, this uh, we're hopeful that we can, uh, we can work with some of our colleagues across the country to help do this. Because the prevalence is so low in Nova Scotia, it makes it more difficult to do because we just don't have the samples to try and validate the assays. So uh, with that, I will uh, stop and uh, I am happy to entertain uh, any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Hatchett, for your presentation. Um, we're going to go to our Q&A segment. So if you do have a question, feel free to raise your hand icon. Um, and we'll also look to the chat box. Uh, I'm just scanning the chat box right now. Um, I know there's some discussion going on, but I'm just going to try to pull out some questions. Um, so related to the ELISA, two-step ELISA test, uh, can you comment, does the, does the sensitivity of the test change as the disease progresses from more of an acute phase for those that might be tested versus someone who's been living with the disease more chronically? So the, the, the advantage is that it is more sensitive in the acute phase. It's as sensitive as a standard two-tier system for, the, uh, for the, uh, those with uh, disseminated infection. So that's, um, that's the main advantage. There's, it, it works just as well as the, the, two -tier, the standard two-tier for the longer-term ones. Thank you. Um, in regards to the symptoms of false positive, um, were what were you able to comment on what were the symptoms of the false positive that were excluded clinically perhaps in helping with the diagnosis? I don't have all of the data in front of me, but most of them were sort of non-specific symptoms that can be related to other things like fatigue, uh, arthralgias, um, very uh, undifferentiated uh, symptoms. Thank you. They were serologic um, negative for all of them. Thank you, Dr. Hatchett. Now, I know uh, during your discussion, uh, you talked about the changes and how pharmacists pr proactively can give a single doses if there is um, suspected Lyme uh, tick bite. Um, are there any currently any long-term studies going on in Nova Scotia that are following any patients that might have received the single dose of the prophylaxis? None that I'm aware of. We're just looking at the uh, databases to look at the uh, uptake of, of uh, pharmacy um, provided prophylaxis. I'm not aware of any long-term follow-ups for other ones. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so obviously with Lyme, that's a very common test that's ordered uh, not in, across the country, um, provincially in the labs, as well as in Nova Scotia. Are there other types of tests that are available or run? Um, you talked about the panel. Um, are there common ones that are automatically run or is that more ones that, you know, people have to specifically request? So we've added anaplasma to the Lyme disease as part of an automatic uh, referral. So there's no need to request that at the moment. Um, if Babesia was uh, uh, 
sus suspected, you'd actually have to request that. Um, it's often precipitated by a positive smear. So people see the parasites of the smear and, and knowing that they look similar to malaria. Um, if they don't have a travel history and their malaria antigens are negative, that's highly suspicious that this is uh, Babesia that we would then uh, confirm with uh, diagnostic testing. Um, but those would be the sort of the, the adding um, adding the Babesia uh, to the to the uh, panel is our our next goal, so that that becomes automatic rather than uh, rather than re by request. Thank you. I see Dr. Kadir has his hand up. Go ahead, Dr. Kadir. Hello, do you hear me? Hello? Yes, we hear you. You're good. Oh, good, good. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Hashid. Um, I uh, must say that um, uh, based on um, some work that uh, uh, was carried in my hospital since the last four years, we have come to consider the possibility of long, longer than three months treatments of some patients presenting with sufficient uh, arguments believing that uh, Lyme, uh, undetected Lyme might be the, the cause of what you have called uh, just, uh, just a few moments ago as non-specific general symptoms, fatigue, arthralgias, when other elements, clinical elements for pre for, were present. Uh, I have a uh, a specific number of patients, for example, that had uh, the target lesion, that had the epidemiological uh, exposure, you know, the epidemiological um, uh, risk factors strong uh, from where their activities and where they were living, but they were uh, they didn't receive antibiotics because of absent IgG, uh, and then things. Uh, uh, brought them a few years later to uh, to find no other diagnosis, convincing diagnosis rheumatologically, internal medicine, neurologically, and uh, ended up being treated for more than uh, three months at our clinic. And part of those patients responded in sometimes a very dramatic manner, uh, responded when antibiotics stopped too soon, uh, uh, witnessed uh, exacerbation of their symptoms and responded. Of course, in the discussions I have had and then reflections I have had, there is a possibility that some of the drugs we are administrating to them, for example, doxycycline, azithromycin, might act through their um, through their anti-inflammatory um, activity, uh, especially now that we know that uh, interferon alpha might play a role in uh, late neuroborreliosis, as was shown in a recent paper uh, from people from Europe, uh, Dr. Frank Sterl and, and colleagues, uh, and doxycycline having activity, very demonstrable activity uh, on uh, uh, interferon alpha might be the, the cause. But considering that there is debate about also the possibility of persistent, as it was shown in the good work of Dr. Monica Ambers and company, how how sure are we uh, in our categorization uh, as to be fails positive uh, when the gold standard on which we rely in defining our uh, the fact that they are fails positive are the standard Western blood two tiered um, categorization? Because as I understood in your study of two thousand and I think it was 2021. In fact, you consider them to be failed positive based on the absence of IgG. Is that right? That is correct. How how how, how could we be considering the, the debate and the uh, increasing um, um, animal model and also human uh, um, studies that show that persistent is a possibility and uh, uh, for for Lyme as well as for COVID, for example, actually for uh, long haul COVID, there is a huge amount of evidence mounting that also include the possibility of persistence in some tissue. How would you approach that these uh, controversies, Dr. Hashim? 
So I think there's no question that people are suffering from um, chronic undifferentiated symptoms, whether or not they have Lyme disease is the bigger question. Now that we've seen this with long co with COVID, it's not surprising that you can have these post-inflammatory conditions that are caused by uh, an infection and COVID's just the latest example of that. Um, I'd argue that uh, the animal models for persistent infection actually aren't that robust with Lyme disease, but we're not here to sort of get into a debate on that. As you said, it, it is controversial. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, the, the modified two-tier certainly offers an advantage for improved sensitivity. Um, the six false positives, there are eight false positives we said to look at specificity. They would have been picked up as positive cases and would have been treated um, based on the MTT. So I think it offers the advantage of of, uh, of showing that. Now the MTT, um, you know, does have its uh, disadvantages uh, unless you can differentiate IgM and IgG um, moving forward, which you one of the algorithms does that. We just use the combined assay. But, uh, you know, I think it performs better than the STT and uh, certainly is an improvement to our current standard. Uh, can I just follow up with one more question about that? Dr. Ratchet, you are in the business of this, these testing since a long time. I know your, your work since at least 10 years. I, I've seen papers. So one, one uh, element that is missing to my knowledge and understanding is that when we deal with patients with long-standing symptoms that have gone, whether it was detected but lacked the appropriate IgG, so they were denied treatment, or uh, they, they just uh, went about their life because they weren't knowing the disease, they didn't recognize it initially, but years later came up with long-standing. So we often deal with patients with, which had their contact, possible contact with the tick and the bacteria, for five years or more ago, how would we, um, how, uh, what is the scientific basis, uh, not considering the possibility that circulating antibodies have gone too low to be able to detect them even with our ELISAs? So for people who haven't been, I, I'm not talking about PTLDS, but of those patients who clearly have had erythema migrants, some, uh, um, general, um, I mean, viral symptom and flu-like symptoms initially, then they, uh, they were improved and went on with their life and come up years later with a convincing and consistent and coherent uh, clinical uh, evolution uh, and also um, the erythema migrants. And then we do all the testing five or six years later we, there is no evidence of anything, ELISA, they have had never a treatment. How could we suppose that if the infection was still active, they would have antibody? Knowing that uh, uh, the Borrelia is a uh, um, seldom circulating bacteria and will go on to be present in tissues and might just like any other infectious disease in long term, witness a lowering of circulating antibodies. So I would argue that they never had Lyme disease in the first place. I don't see any, I don't, not aware of any data that show that there is seroreversion in un, untreated individuals with confirmed Lyme disease. So they're looking, this, this is, uh, you know, the crux of the controversy um, that Really, I think we should stop focusing on putting a label and treating them with long-term antibiotics, which have never been shown to be a benefit and actually working to, to make their symptoms better and get them back and healthy and, and uh, productive again. And, and stop worrying about labels and, and, and adding treatments that have never been shown to work. Thank you, good Dr. Katir. And just recognizing time, I'm just gonna wrap up the discussion. Um, I just wanted to thank everybody for personally attending today's discussion. I also want to take this time to personally thank Dr. Hatchett for his presentation and updates from Nova Scotia. I do want to let everybody know that we are continuing our discussions tomorrow 
On May 30th at 12 p.m., uh, Danny Zaros will be presenting on the topic, a, scoop, a scoping review of modern Lyme disease prediction methodologies. So we hope you can attend tomorrow at noon. And then our final presentation will be on Wednesday, May 31st at one o'clock and Steph Cooper will be presenting. Uh, just a reminder to take part in our challenge, wear green, take a photo and share it with us to help spread awareness of Lyme disease and tick-borne diseases. You can also send in a photo of your creative artwork that also expresses Lyme disease and tick-borne disease for the Awareness Month. Um, all photos submitted will be automatically entered in our draw for one of four $25 Starbucks e-gift cards. And the live draw will take place at one one o'clock Eastern time on May 31st. Um, please send your photos to Clydern at gmail.com along with your name and email. And last, uh, just a reminder that we hope to be opening up registration abstract submission on Thursday, June 1st for our first inaugural uh, TICNET Canada Scientific Symposium that will be taking place in Toronto, Ontario um, during October 24th to 25th. So we do hope that um, you can join us then for that symposium. Again, thank you to Dr. Hatchett for presenting today. Um, I do want to thank everyone for joining us today, and I hope you have a great rest of your day, a great rest of your week, and hope to see you soon. Take care, everybody.